Let's go to James, the book of James, Hebrew James, fourth chapter. The context that we're looking at is chapter 4, verses 1 through 10. And when you begin to read it, you realize you can divide that into two sections for study. Verses 1 through 5 deals with the problem, and 6 through 10 deals with the solution. The problem is based on the word pleasure in verse 4. It's used in verse 4, and ver, uh, it's in chapter 4, it's used in verse 1, the word pleasure, and used again in verse 3, the word pleasure. The word pleasure is hedone, hedone, H-E-D-O-N-E, is where you get the English word hedonism, hedonism. And it means to be engaged in some form of worldly pleasure in excess. For a Christian, that would mean <clears throat> that this, this pleasure, the pursuit of pleasure would trump anything God told you about it. You're going to choose pleasure over what God says, no matter what. We would probably describe that condition in a person as addictive when you just can't talk to them. They're just not going to listen to you. They're not going to listen to you. They're not going to listen to God. They don't want nobody to tell them what to do. It's my life. I'm going to live it, yada, yada. And the first five verses deals with hedonism. And we have studied this in pretty good detail. When you get, uh, when you get to verse 6, James now outlines what he considers to be the solution to the problem of hedonism in his day. Now, he's, he's writing this, you know, the Ch Pentecost begins in 30 A.D., and we're into f middle 40 A.D., and he's writing on this subject. Um, here's what he says. He says, he gives greater grace, therefore, it says, and he quotes Proverbs 3.34 from the Septuagint. The Septuagint was the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible. It was the Bible in the day of Christ. These are the, this is the Bible, kind of like what people uh, do in the English translation. The first one we were able to really get our hands on that is still one of the key Bibles for us is the King James Bible, the King James Bible. Well, their Bible, the Bible they carried, uh, because of the Greek and Roman Empire uh, dominance of the world of that time, the translation they had that was called the Septuagint, or sometimes you'll see it in the Roman number 7, LXX, because of the number of translators involved in it. And so I'm telling you that Proverbs 3.34, later you can read it, in your own Bible, you can look up Proverbs 3.34 and read it and see uh, some of the changes. But they trans they're transliterated out of the Hebrew into the Greek. And so their James Bible is a Greek translation of the Hebrew. And so he's quoting Proverbs 3.34 out of his Bible, uh, Greek translation, the Septuagint. And so... He says, God, here's what it says in the Septuagint. God is opposed to the proud, the arrogant, but gives grace to the humble. Now, that's the thesis of his argument. So what he's referring to in this is in the fourth chapter, one through five, he's talking about hedonism. Hedonism, which is found in the word pleasure, where I explain. What he's describing in the first five verses, this is important, is what he calls out of Proverbs 3.34, the proud. They're, they're, they're proud or arrogance, where they're not going to listen to God. They're not going to listen to anybody who speaks for God. They're not interested in that. 
And I'm talking about believers as well as unbelievers. No matter. And so, if you want to know what, what James is talking about in the, in pro, the proud, you, you look at verses 1 through 5 and the problems it brings. Now, what he does, so that's the first part of the verse. Look at the verse again. In verse 6, we're talking about Proverbs 3.34, and if you have a study Bible, you'll see in the cross-reference section, you'll see that. Um, Oh, I got gotcha. you. I was going to say we we have a Bible, but we we don't have large print. Let me, huh? This lady. Okay, all right. You can use you, you can use mine. All right. Well, wait. Look, look we get it after after class. We get it after class. Huh? We'll just run out the car and get that big Bible then. Yeah. Okay. Okay, that'd be great. Run out, run out and get it. We're going to... Whoa! I mean, that, that was a speedway right there, wasn't it? I mean... That's kind of thrill your heart? I mean, Don did that when you were like... I thought maybe a policeman, that sound would kind of thrill him. I finally got somebody to run after. Um, uh, let's see, where, where was I when I, uh, oh, the proud. He, the proud is going to be, the, the proud, this is the proud. Then he goes to four, six through ten, and w what's the other word? What's, pr proud is one, what's the What's the opposite word that we're looking for? Humble. 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 And he's going to describe what he thinks is the humble. And the gap, now watch this, this is important because James is going to call what he's going to call, and you and I would never call it this, but what, what he's going to say, now we're going to agree with him that grace, we're going to agree with him that grace is what fills the gap. God's grace is what fills the what makes the difference. We're going to agree with him on that. But we may struggle a little bit with him. <laughs> but he's struggling with it too. If you know anything, we've talked about James and his struggle in the 40s with this principle of grace. His, his view of grace is, is, you're going to see his view of grace is different than Jesus and Paul, his view of grace. But he's got the, and listen, if you know anything about grace, in the church there's a different view about grace. It's the same word but different view uh, on it. So we're, we're going to talk about some of that tonight uh, in this study. But the, my lesson title, Grace to the Humble, uh, comes from the Septuagint translation of Proverbs uh, 3.34, and it's, of course, how he opens up the subject of giving greater grace. He said what's required of this to fill that, to make this change that's necessary, he calls it, it's going to take a greater work of grace, a greater work of grace. And he's right. But we'll see what his method is and whether that is correct. Uh, the proud that God opposes in our passage is described as hedonistic reversionism and uh, believers and unbelievers can participate in it as you well know when we describe what that is. Hedonism is described in our text as worldly pleasure that trumps the desire to be faithful to the truth of God's word regarding the pleasure source. That's very important. You might, you might underline that. That's pretty important. Now, tonight, I don't know. I'm going to try to get to four aspects of this. We'll see where we go with it. Let me give you one example, and this is a modern one. This is one that you live with in your life uh, among people of your generation and mine. One example of hedonistic pleasure is sex outside of marriage. This is, 
this is not only bad for unbelievers, it's terrible for believers. This is a, this is a no, 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 no. And when people know what the Bible says about it and refuse to obey that and would seek the pleasure above what God tells them, that's hedonistic. So it's important that we understand that because let me tell you, we live in a culture today that's just abs in the church and out of the church. Listen, when it comes to sex, the church in the church and out of the ch church, they're both eat up with it. At least that's been my experience. Uh, I, broke this, I broke this idea down into three parts. There's the single person, there is the engaged person, and there's the married person. Sex is important. God designed sex, but he designed it to be operated in marriage. And there, there's got to be a good reason for that. I mean, he didn't say you could only eat certain foods until you got married. But he did say that about sex. You know, people always want to compare what's a natural appetite like food and drink and, and uh, breathing air and all that. Okay, if you want to put it that way, care how you put it. But you got to understand that God designed sex. He put it in the whole human system. And it has two parts to it. He understands and he developed it. It's recreational and it's procreational. It's both. It's an expression of love and it's the results of that expression of love in children. And you really have to understand this, the importance of it. But of course you have to study the Bible to get that. You can't study Dr. Ruth and get it, but you do have to study Dr. God. So here's what he says to the single person, whether, and it doesn't matter what age you are, I don't care if you're 12 or 102. You say, I don't know if I'd be, around, be interested at 102. I got an aunt in the retirement home and she's been shocked at all the visitations that go on in that nursing home, she is appalled by it. The little Lutheran lady um, is really appalled, and she should be. And she's going to clean the nest up, and I said, good luck to that. <laughs> good luck to that. But here's what the Bible says to the single person, whatever age they are. It don't matter if you've been married three times and you're single. Flee, flee immor immorality. Now, the word that's used for there is the word fornication, and, and that's a stronger word than immorality. Immorality suggests that that's a human kind of an issue. Fornication, it's a strong word, and it, it deals with every perverted sex of a sexual act. It's a perverted sexual act. It, it would include bestiality and everything uh, under, under the word fornication. Flee fornication is what it actually says. Now watch this. Here's what you miss. God designed sex. You can read it in Genesis, the first chapter. The second chapter and the third chapter and the fourth chapter, you got kids. At least there's two chapters in between, but so maybe it's a good thing to wait. Every other sin, listen to that, every other sin. Now we're talking about sexual Every other sin that a man commits is outside his body, but the immoral man, the fornicator, sins against his own body. It's going to, listen, it, there's dues to be paid. I mean, he doesn't tell you what all that is, but he tells you it's going to affect your body. It's going to, it's going to affect your body. Do you not know, there's one of Paul, Paul's great deals, do you not know that your body, now he's talking to Christians, that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who dwells in you, who lives in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own. For you have been bought with a price, therefore, which is a big word, 
Therefore, glorify God in your body. So God takes this stuff serious whether you do or don't. See, I tell, I tell teenagers this all the time. You may not take this serious, but God does. This is a serious thing, and you need to pay attention to this because you're going to wind up with some really stuff in your life you're not going to like. You need to pay attention to this. That's, that's recorded in 1 Corinthians 6, 18, 20. So look, here, here, here's the old ring deal. Here's the ring deal. Here's the first time I found the ring deal. The ring deal is a big deal for sex. So the high school guy goes with a girl or junior high now or even before that, maybe right in the crib they might be doing this. I don't know that anymore. But they give them a, a, a going steady something, a ring. Oh, if you put a going steady ring on it, you're married. You're married. And you have all the rights. God says, nope. And listen, every time God says, nope, the guy who doesn't listen is a dope. Okay? Now we come to engaged. This is where it really gets serious, because now I'm of age. I'm 12. 12. And so he speaks to the, this is a passage I say for the engaged. Now concerning is about what you wrote. It's a good, it, it is good for a man not to touch. The word is harpto in the Greek language, and it means to sexually arouse another person. <laughs> Do you know how many dates would you would get without that? The girl says, uh-uh, we're not going there. And there's no second date on that list. Unless he understands the word of God. Especially when the hormones are driving him. And he's just 16 or 17, 18 or 19. Listen, not to sexually arouse it. So here's what he does. Now I, had a, I went to college with a guy that he had an, he went out and bought an engagement ring. I'm telling you. He was the smartest guy on campus for the fornicators. He was the master fornicator. And he would date a girl, and she'd say, no, 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 and he'd go like, I respect you. This is the woman I'm looking for. I know I roamed with this guy. Yes, you're the... You, He'd slide a ring on her finger, and boy, it was all over. Because she knew they were going to get married. He had no intentions of that. He had no intentions of it. Jeez, is that sick? So a lot of guys will slide that ring on and say, well, we're, we're getting married. We're going to get married, and yada, yada. We got the date set, and the cards are out. Now, let's, let's do this thing. Let's, let's taste the apple. You know what God says? Nope. nope. And the person that lives in God says, what? Nope. Well, thank you. <laughs> thank you. You see, and the reason is that the ring is for marriage. Marriage. Listen to what second, uh, 1 Corinthians 7, chapter, verse 2 says. But because of fornications or immoralities, each person is to have his own wife, and each woman is to have her own husband. Now we put, place the ring, and we're, we're, that ring is there till death do us part. We don't believe that part either, but that's a whole other sermon. So listen, what Paul is talking about is this very subject in hedonism. You know what the Bible says? Do you know what the church teaches? Do you know what is the right thing? They go, yeah, but I, I don't care. I'm going to do it anyhow. Do you know what the Bible says if you go ahead and do it anyhow? Yeah? Do you know it's a sin against your body? 
I don't care. I can handle it. But you know, when you're 16, you can handle anything, right? That guy that just drove down there 100 miles an hour, he thinks he can fly. Eh? Thinks he can fly. All this has to be cleaned up and has to be cleaned up in the church first. The church can't have a voice to the world when they don't have a voice to speak. You understand? Eh. <laughs> I need to preach that all day, don't I? I need to say that again. But we need to clean the church up because we don't have a voice to the world. This is the way the world thinks, and we have to give them a better option. It's going to destroy their life. In the end, it will destroy them. <coughs> and uh, now they carry this engagement ring into let, let's just live together, make sure we could make it before we get. What are you talking about, Megan? It. Listen, we we really have to do this. We have got to. And listen. youngest son of my aunt went off to college, a big athlete, come home for his sophomore year. He did really good. His fret, well, we don't know what he did his freshman year, but he did good in sports, and he, and he, and he lasted to go to the sophomore year. <laughs> so we don't really know. But his sophomore year at Christmas time, he called his mom. We're farm people. You know, we're we're... We eat dust for a living. You know, I, we're down to earth, just Central America. You know what I mean? We're Middle America kind of people. And if whether we're saved or not, I said, we don't believe in this kind of stuff. So he calls his mother and said, I'm going to bring a, I got a, going with a girl and I'd like to bring her home for Christmas. Well, we were all thrilled to death. Right? I bring her home. Let's check her out. And, uh, he gets home with her, and he says to his mother, uh, she said, well, I got your, I've got you, your room. Your brother is, is going to stay, stay with a friend. You can have his room, and we have your room, uh, to, told the young lady, we have your room ready. And uh, he said, Mother, I need to speak to you a minute. And she said, well, sure. He, she thought, change the rooms or something. And he says, now we sleep in the same room, the same bed. When hell freezes over, <laughs> was my aunt's answer, when hell freezes over and there is no God, that might be okay. Well, he said, then uh, there will be no Christmas for us in this house. And she said, well, apparently it's a choice you've been making right along, so, so be it. So be it. But you know how many parents won't do that? They won't do that. They won't do that. God bless her for doing it because she drew the line in the sand for his benefit. For his benefit. Look, and, and she felt bad for the girl. She said, I just, I hate that. And, and the girl wanted to stay. She was okay with the, the room and everything. The boy's making a big issue. I love my aunt for that. Boy, she drew the sword and put it right to his throat. <laughs> you ain't going to do that. <laughs> you ain't going to do that. When hell, when hell freezes over and there is no God, <laughs> you might do that. But until then, it ain't ever going to happen. It ain't ever going to happen. See, that's, does that mean she doesn't love him? Mm, means she loves God. And if she can't transfer the love of God to him, then, the love that he's after is not the love she has. That's craziness that what he wants to do with that girl is absolutely craziness. That's not, that's not the love that she understands with, that she has with God. So, you know, it has to begin with the church. You know, the church is not just this building, is it? The church, the, 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 you know the church when the church gets out. When the church is over is when you get to meet the church. Not while the church is going. You get to meet the church when they leave, what kind of people they really are. That's the church. And that's the church I'm talking about. I'm not talking about the guy in the pulpit all the time. I'm talking about the guy that carries the pulpit with him. I'm talking about the mobile church. 
We've got to be this church. This is the church we got to be. The world has got to see that Jesus Christ is in the life changing for the better. For the better. This is not worse for you. This is better for you. Well, anyhow, point number two, the hedonistic reversionism that James is talking about operates from a cosmos diabolical or a worldly system of thinking apart from the word of God. What we call it cosmos diabolical, two Greek words that means the world under the devil's system of thinking. Because either you're under God's system or the devil's, there's no in between it. And I tell you that, whether you believe it or not, it's true. And when you're under the devil's system, you're under what the Greeks called kakos, K-A-K-O-S, that's evil. That's, that's the, you know, the evil, you know the problem with most people? They never see evil until it gets to depravity today. Evil has to be so evil, nobody sees evil unless it's really evil. Really evil. I mean, it really has to be, it takes your breath away. It's so bad, it takes your breath. They don't see evil when people call it good. There's so much evil in the world today they call good, and people have bought into it. We only see it now when it's really depraved, and people go like, oh, jeez. Kekos evil. And the devil likes to, likes to disguise evil as good. And when he got a society where he can run it down to depravity, and some people say, well, I don't see where you think that's so bad. There, there's some movies I couldn't be able to go see. They're so evil. What they do to other people are so evil. I well, couldn't go watch that in a million years. They say, well, I go see them because it frightens me to death. You'll go with a cop on a weekend then. You ride with a cop on a weekend and you'll get, you'll get the thrill of your life. Jeez. Hedonistic reversionism is opposed to the revealed directive will of God. In other words, what the Bible says don't do, we give disregard to. Pertaining to worldly pleasure, this is especially, and they coined a word for it. It was so prevalent in the Greek and the Roman culture, and it's prevalent in our culture, but we don't call it hedonism. We don't have a word for it. We call it addiction. Porno di addiction, uh, you know, and the list that we've got a list is just gigantic. And listen, that list is changing. When I took my psychology courses 100 years ago, we called it abnormal. <laughs> it was abnormal behavior. That, but they, they, they wouldn't let that book in the library today. It was a major textbook. Jeez. Well, it's opposed to the revealed directive will of God, that which God says don't do, pertaining to world pleasure that people disregard as God laying it out and t giving them the dangers, mentioned in point one. It's a... It, it, we're up to our eyeballs in it, and we've, we've gotten accustomed to it's just let it rock along. I, my, aunt, my aunt should be the one teaching this lesson, should she? It's my aunt. Now, in point, in point number one, talking about sexual... Here, I want you to pay attention to me now because I'm going to, I'm going to give you something you will never hear anyplace else. I'm going to tell you how this thing goes. I'm going to show you the background to it. Point number one, this sexual perversion kind of stuff going on, the Bible calls fornication. We cleaned it up and called it immoral. Immoral? It's so beyond immoral. It's, it, it's evil. It's not immoral. When you say immoral, then you're comparing it to moral, Right? That's not a word. That's not. That's not what fornication is. Fornication is, and it, and listen. If you stay in it, is if you if you repeat fornication enough times, it, you become a fornicator. That's a lifestyle. You drink enough, you become a drunkard. Now that's a lifestyle. You know what I'm saying? If you eat enough, you become a glutton. If you stay a glutton, that's a lifestyle. These are lifestyles. So you become, you become what your addiction declares you are. You right? 
uh, drugs and the first source of AM, you have to become a drug addict, and, uh, et cetera. And that's what we're talking about here. Now, they're in de they're, what there is, we, ha we have a sin nature. Man has a sin nature, and that sin nature has trends. Because some people, for example, when I was a young boy, I tried smoking. I hated it. Then my mother caught me and made me smoke a cigar. I threw up all the time. I was done with cigarettes. <laughs> you understand? We, and so I, I don't have a problem with that. I don't have a problem with that. But listen, we, have, we all have a sin nature, so we have a problem with something. Because we have trends. We have trends. Now, there, there is what we call a body trend. And in that body trend, it could be sexual. It could be drug. It could be, it could be food. It, listen, even sports. I got addicted to running. I ran for endorphins, and I couldn't understand why I got one mile, oh, if I could just run one mile. Then I was at three, and then I was at six, and then I was at 12, and then I was thinking about running a marathon. My wife said, do you know how long it takes to run a marathon? Uh, I went, no. She said, hours, especially you. <laughs> <laughs> you can't run a mile at that speed for 26. And I went, and, and then I had a friend. I said, what is wrong with me? I said, I mean, I will run if it rains, if it snows. I'm going to run. I got to run. I got to run. He said, endorphins. I want endorphins. That fat's an endorphin. And he said, that's why you run. It's narcotic. Yeah, it's your narcotic. You run till you get it, and then you get it. And he said, you know, you run till you get it, and then you feel like, oh, wow, I could run. And then your body is but fine, collapse on you. You go like, oh, what's wrong with you? <laughs> you ran yourself to death. I ran, yeah, I ran out of endorphins, and he was dead. Uh, so there, there, are body, there is a body lust trend. We have a sin nature. There are trends. Your, your body lust could, could, could be in the area of sex. It could be food. It could be drugs. It could be a lot of things, but it's, coordinated, it's correlated to the body. It's correlated to the body. And that sexual sin, it's, it's very, very deep into our culture, even in the church. Okay? So that's, that's one way. Another way that hedonism works, off from the old sin nature trends, is materialism. Now, a lot of people wouldn't even think about this. I mean, you can, listen, some people work their whole life and have no life. What drives that back? What drives that? What drives a person to spend his entire life pursuing, 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 and never reach anything? I tell you what it is. It's a materialism lust. Just like the runner. It's the apple, it's a, uh, the applause he gets, it's the rewards he gets, it's the satisfaction of what he's doing, and it's, it's just a, and listen, satisfied with being, being a lonely life. You know what happens to these people? After they retire or lose their business or whatever, they commit suicide. They have no life apart from it. They cannot live apart from it. They have no life. I've known people like this. It's materialism less. Now, let me tell you, a guy you'll be familiar with in the Bible who had it, Judas Iscariot. Judas Iscariot. You know Judas Iscariot in the Bible? What'd he do? Betray he betrayed Jesus Christ for how much? 30. 30 pieces of silver. Now, when you read about his story, and I wrote it down here under, under point two, in John, the 12th chapter, verses four and five, I only wrote verse six down, but if you read that little section in there, in verse 4, Judas goes and, and, and uh, sets in his mind that he should betray, he's going to betray the Messiah. And, 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 and the, the reason for it had nothing to do with Christ. It had to do with money. In the John, this 12th chapter, verse 6, it says Judas was in charge of the money of the ministry and was pilfering it. And it, he was taken off, you know, he was cooking the books. Skimming. He was cooking the books, man. He was taking the money and cooking the books. That's, that's John, the 12th chapter. He's already identified. In Matthew, the 26th chapter, 14 through 19, he goes to the Pharisees. Listen, at the season of Passover, he go, Passover is one of the most glorious days in the life of Israel. For the coming of Christ, 
on the Passover season, he goes and negotiates. He dickers a deal. You would think he was buying a horse or something or an automobile. He goes in and he dickers and he bargains with the Pharisees, and they're not going to give him any more than 30 pieces of silver, and he settles for 30 pieces of silver, which is so dirt cheap. It's the price of a slave. And he just went and bought a pretty decent horse that you could plow with it and ride it. Good grief. In the 27th chapter, verses 3 through 10, Christ dies on the cross, and he is overcome with guilt. In the 27th chapter, verses 3 through 10, he is overcome with remorse. Remorse. Don't forget that word. Not repentance. Remorse. He felt so bad about what he did in his soul. Remorse. He took the money back and told them he didn't want the money and that he had made a terrible mistake. And they wouldn't take the money back. Nope. You're as much a part of this deal as we are. Oh, no. It'll go down into records that we all participated in the death of Jesus Christ. Oh, no. We're not letting you off the hook. If one goes down, the whole ship goes down. He took the money and threw it back. They took it and bought a field called Blood Money Field. Bury the poor that couldn't afford a burial. You know what they, you know what he did when when they said we'll all go down with the ship? He said, Well, I won't go down with you. I can tell you that. He went out and hung himself. He committed suicide. Because they said, No, listen, we're in this together. We'll float as a ship or we'll sink as a ship. And he said, Not me. I'll not sink with you guys. And he went out and committed suicide. You know what suicide is? It's no place to go. Not a friend in the world. That may not be true, but that's the way you believe. Jesus, Jesus took him back. But he waited. Waited too long. Jesus offered him a lot of opportunities to come home. And he refused to do it. You know why? Because he was, he was hung up in hedonism, materialistic hedonism, out of his own life's choices. There's another example of the old sin nature in us and how trends work in our life. Power. I see it in a lot of marriages. I see it in a lot of marriages. She uses one thing to control him, he uses another thing to control her, and everything eventually gets out of control, right? Eventually, it's got to go. I mean, the whole thing is there's going to be a wreck coming somewhere. And I'm going to give you one that's really interesting. I want you to read with me on this one. Go to Matthew, the 20th chapter of Matthew with me. Parents do this a lot, and so I'm going to warn you about it in Christ. Matthew, the 20th chapter, looking at verses 20 through 28. The mother of the sons of Jeb Zebedee came to him with her sons. That's James and John called the sons of what? <laughs> Thunder. thunder. <laughs> the sons of thunder. That was a pair, don't you know? You talk about two strong-willed boys, don't you know? That that must have been something. The sons of, sons of thunder. Sounds like a music group, doesn't it? Sure does. And now here comes the sons of thunder. Da -da 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 -da. And she comes to make a request. Now, they're related to Jesus. He said to her, what do you wish? She said to him, Command that in your kingdom these two sons of mine may set one on your right and one on your left. <laughs> oh, hey, there's a bunch of gals right now in trouble over this very thing, trying to get their kids into college, aren't they? Uh, one on the right, one on the left. Oh, boy. Come on, mama. 
Leave it alone, mama. Leave it alone. Listen, God has a better plan than you'll ever have. Jesus answered and said, you do not know what you're asking for. <laughs> Boy, is that true. Are you able to drink the cup that I am to drink? And the two boys said, yep. <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, boy. Uh, he said to them, okay, my cup you shall drink, but to sit on my right and on my left is not mine to give. Boy, be careful what you ask for. They asked for it. They said, are you, he said, are you sure, boys? And they said, yep. And he said, okay, you got my cup, but you don't get my seat. Now, he tells them why. And hearing this, the ten became indignant with the two brothers. <laughs> oh, this is too good to be true. In fighting, they actually think this is a serious request. And so they're all upset that they didn't ask first. <laughs> oh, jeez. Oh, I tell you, no one of the church is messed. Jesus called them to himself, and he said privately, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. It is not so among you, but whoever wishes to become the greatest you shall be your servant. You shall be the servant. And whoever, whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. The mother was so out of line. We see it so often in parents trying to live vicariously through their kids. They push their kids into places they should never be pushed. Listen, leave it to God. He pushes gently for all the right reasons. You know what's interesting about this? Now, I didn't put this on your paper. I'm going to show you something really interesting. I'm in Matthew 20 when the mother comes. You should see how this, how this lit up. Chapter 17. You know what's famous in chapter 17? Listen to me. The transfiguration. The transfiguration of Jesus Christ. We, he, he goes through that transfer, transformation, right? Yes. And he's got three disciples with him. Right? He's got three disciples. You know who the three disciples are? Peter, James, and John. You know who James and John are? The two sons of thunder. All right. All right. Keep that in your mind. Now you go to the 18th chapter. When you go to the 18th chapter, I'm just showing you what's there. I'm just giving you highlights. When you go to the 18th chapter and you're looking at verse 4, Jesus tells his disciples, because he knows they're, they're, waffle, they're waffling. He, he says, whoever humbles himself, there's our word in my text today, whoever humbles himself as a child, he is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. You know what he does? He who humbles himself like a little child is the greatest in the kingdom. They missed that one too, didn't they? They missed the transformation lesson. They missed this great lesson that he just told the disciples. Now you go to the 19th chapter. I'm just giving you highlights. What is going on in the background of this request? And Jesus puts his hands to his head like, you guys are not listening to me. You guys are not listening to me. I've been pounding this in chapter 17. I pounded this in 18. I pounded this in 19. I'm now, now we got mother. You got your mother in front of you. Guys, you're not listening. I feel so, that way sometimes. Matthew, the 19th chapter, verse 27 through 30. And here's, here's a summary of it. But, and and, and he, he, he tells them this later in chapter 20. But many who are first will be what? Last. And the last shall be first. And now he has to tell them again in chapter 20. They haven't listened. They've been to church. They've been listening to one of the greatest Bible teachers they've ever sat under ever in their life and have no respect for the teaching he's given them. 
Don't be those people. They didn't listen to chapter 17. And I just picked up, I just picked up where we are. I didn't go back further. I can, if I, I can take you to 16 where, G, where G, Peter rebukes Jesus and Jesus tells him, you're a stumbling block to me. Get behind me, Satan, right? That's chapter 16. I mean, I can go back and show you highlights further back than this. They're going to church. They're sitting under a great teacher, the rabbi of rabbis, and they're not listening. They're not listening to the truth that's being taught them and putting that truth in their life in practical application. You've got to be careful. Listen, you can sit anywhere and not become it. Listen, you sit in a garage, you don't become a car. You can sit in church and never be a dynamic Christian because you don't pay any attention to what's being taught you. You got to quit that. I'm not fussing at you. You're here tonight. But listen, they were at every Bible study he taught. He, they were every, every one of them and weren't taking it in in one ear, not the other. Oh, I think I can manage my life. I think I got a handle on it. Who is he to tell me? Man, I hear all that kind of foolishness. Listen, take the word of God. Take it at face value and put it in your life and quit playing around. Quit playing church when it's not church. That's what I'm saying. Where am I in my time? Well, I still got a little bit. Now, I want to show you something here with James. Third chapter, I mean, uh, point three. James gives the doctrinal solution. He gives his doctrinal solution of God opposing the proud, proud and giving grace to the humble. Are you with me? He's laid out the proud. Now he's going to tell you, how do you move from being proud under greater grace to being humble? Right? So I did something for you. I broke this down. Do you see those do you see those brackets? Look for these brackets. Like this, you got 3 of them. You see those? In the first bracket, I want you to write this next to the bracket, would you? You and God. The next bracket, I want you to write steps. Your steps your steps. And on the third bracket, I want you to write God and you. Got it. The first bracket was you and God. The last bracket is God and you. Now, here's what's interesting in this passage. James, James issues 10 imperatives. An imperative in the Greek language is a, is, a, is a command. It's a command. It's a very, it's in the Greek language, these are commands. In the aorist imperative, an aorist imperative is the strongest command that you can give somebody. In the army, they would call it a hut to command. And it means a command that's come down all the way from the top down to where you are. If you're a PFC, then that aorist imperative, that command that came down, came down, down through the whole chain of command to the, to the lowest guy on the totem pole, and everybody above that has bought into that command or better. That's a chain of command. It's the strongest. And the aorist tense applies to every aspect, every, every, every slot of command, you know, the general all the way down to the PFC and the military idea. That's a hut to command. And everybody in that chain of command has bought into that command. Whatever that set of commands is, everybody from the top is brought in until it gets down to the last guy in the totem pole. Was PFC? I guess that's the last guy. Is that the last guy? Private. Well, private. Well, private. <laughs> well let me take the, the FC off in case you think it's Kentucky Fried Chicken. <laughs> it says leave, leave it down there to a P. Uh, uh, well, we can understand what that is. But years ago, the private did start off as a PFC. Yeah, change it so you have to stay a little while longer. All right, so I, I just want you to understand we got, when you see an aorist, and that you will see it in the Greek, I'm going to show it to you in a moment as we go through. There are 10 of them. 
So it's a list of commands that come from God down the pike, so to speak. Now, James is saying, I have these by authority. I'm passing them down. He's in this chain of command. And here's what James, now here's the first, first three. See that A-P-I-M-V-P, see that I-M-V, see the word submit? Yeah. I gave you the Greek word, huputasso. Huputasso refers to this entire chain of command down to the lowest guy. That's huputasso. Huputasso, the word submit in the English, in the Greek says huputasso, it means more than submit. It means to submit, everybody in that chain of command has to submit to that, that command. That set of commands that's given. Okay? The word submit. Active, passive, imperative. Submit. So James says the first thing you have, now these ten commands is going to give you ten steps. The first set of steps that James says are really good. He says submit to God. Resist the devil. Notice that's an A. See that A? That's an heiress. See, heiress. A, A, heiress, the act of imperative in the Greek language. He says, resist the devil, and then he gives a promise. Submit to God. Here's a, here's a twofold act. It's, it's not, even though it's listed as two, it's, you do the first thing first, and then you do the second thing second in that order. Are you with me? The first thing you've got to do, he says, you've got to submit. And the second thing you've got to do is immediately, once you submit, you've got to resist the devil. You've got to resist. Right? You've got to submit to God and resist the devil. It's, it's not submit today and resist the devil a year from now. All right? So you've got to do that. That's and. You've got to submit and resist. And what's the promise? If you will do these two things, what's he promise? The devil, will flee from you. the devil will flee from you. Right? He'll flee from you. All right? There, and there's a promise with it, right? All right. Then the second set, there, there are six things. The, here are the steps that he gives you to do this. He says, he, and his goal is to get you to humble. It will get you from, from proud to humble. Are you with me? First, you got, here's, here's what you got to do. You got to submit to God. You got to resist the devil. Because that's where the whole thing's coming from, right? He's the source of this whole deal. Heathenism. Yeah. Right. Okay. And he said the devil will flee from him. There's a promise. Now watch this. Number one, he says, here, and he, so he gives you six steps. He says, first, you've got to cleanse your hands. That's an aorist imperative. You sinners. Two, you got to purify. Notice these are all aorist imperatives. This is the command that James is listing. You got to purify your hearts, you double minded. Three, you got to be miserable. Four, mourn. Five, weep. Six, let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom. Are you with me? That's James Steps. Where is he trying to get you? He's trying to get you out of being proud and get you into humble. Are you with me? Let's go to the third. So there's, th th listen, it, listen. Is there a promise with it? Is there a promise? In those six steps, did he give you a promise? In the first three, in the first two steps, submit and resist, he gave you a promise. In the next six steps, did he give you a promise in those six steps, like at the end of them? No, he did not. Now, it's important. No, he did not. So we got a third. Mm. What about drawing near? Well, that's not. Is that. Uh, it's up there in the first one. Oh, that, yeah, draw near. Uh, submit. So, uh, you're right. On the draw near. Submit and resist and draw near. There were three parts on the front and draw near to God and the devil will flee from you. Resist. You're right, Pam. Thank you. Submit, resist, and draw near. Now, it, when he says draw near, there's two parts to the first part and there's a promise. In the second part of that, draw near to God. See, it's a God thing. See the God thing? Mm -hmm. See the God thing? The God thing is very important. And he's right on the money. Draw near to God and there's a promise. He will draw near to you. Are you with me? 
there's a promise there. Now, when we come to the steps that he gives you, there's no promise given. Now, we come to the third one, which is conclusion. He says, humble, we're back to an heiress. See, we're following, the, we're tracking, what we're tracking, people, are the Ten Commands, the Ten Imperatives. And we're, we're watching where, 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 where the intervals are and where they're not. Okay? In the third part section of this, humble, notice the aorist imperative, humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord. Is there a promise? Yes. yes, there is. And he will exalt, which means to lift you up or promote you like he did with Joseph in undeserved suffering we've been studying on Tuesday. Without Without, listen, I will lift you up and promote you like Joseph without reversionism. Joseph wasn't in reversionism when he did it. He did, he did it without reversionism. Do you see the promise? Yes, yes. Now, look, this is really important. This is really important in his word of God. You're looking for what God promises, and he makes it very clear. In the first section, submit, resist, and draw near, he gives you promises. When he comes to steps, he doesn't. And when he comes to conclusions, the humble, there's a promise again. There's a promise again. So I'm going to show you what Jesus says about it. And you can determine how you want to do this. Because I personally don't like those steps with grace. I don't think grace works that way. And so... I have a problem with that, personally. I think that's part of James' Old Covenant thinking, not New Covenant thinking, personally. That's my personal opinion. But listen to this. Jesus gives a different doctrinal solution to the prodigal son. The prodigal son is in hedonism, reversionism. When you read Luke 15, 11 through 32, you will see that the prodigal son was engaged in hedonistic reversionism, it was called loose living in verse 13 and called uh, living with, pro with prostitution in verse 30. Jesus gives a new covenant solution, a doctrinal solution, while living in the old covenant. I mean, he's the guy who's teaching this. Listen, 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 listen when you read the parable, how it goes. The prodigal become imp impoverished in verse 14, he went and got a job, but he couldn't meet his necessities of life. Verses 15 and 16. In verse 17, he came to his senses. His senses about his life with God being so much better than his life in the world. He said in verse 17, I am dying from hunger and do not have to die in hunger. Because in my father, I left really a good deal. And I could go back to my father. I would be better off working for him. I know he will probably never accept me as a son. I will be glad to go back and just work with him. Because I'm telling you, the people that work for my father are so much better off than the people who work for the world. Are you with me? Because the world tries to keep you in slavery. Only God can free you. It was for this reason that Christ came into the world, to set you free. <clears throat> so, he comes to his senses. Here's what he does when he comes to his senses. He gets into a big rehearsal mode of, uh, under, of ideas. A big rehearsal of ideas. When I go back, this is what I'll say and this is how I'll do, and maybe he'll take me back. What he needed to do Right In this big rehearsal, he's thinking what I have to do to get back into the grace of God. Are you with me? You can read this. I mean, I'm just laying it out for you. Most of you are familiar with the story. This is how he's thinking. So the Bible says, so he got up and he returned to his father. See, there's always got to be a guy. You got, there's got to be a, 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 a get up and leave where you are and go back to the father. But he's going back to the father. Now, he's got all these crazy ideas about what he's got to do in order to prepare himself well, to present himself well, when he gets to the Father, right? To make sure that, look, I made a mistake, and I don't know, right? Okay. However, look at the divine viewpoint. While he was still a long way off, now he was on his way home, but he was still a long way off from the Father. He was not in the Father's presence. 
When we see the father, it says this, Father saw him a long way off and felt compassion for him and ran and embraced and kissed him. He never would have thought of that welcome. He thought he had to clean himself up, that he had to present himself in an honorable, some kind of way uh, that the father would take him back just as a hired hand. That he'd never be able to stand in the father's presence ever again. But if he could just stand just to be off from it, while other people would be around the father, at least he could be in the crowd. But that's not what the father saw. Father didn't see that. The father could care less about all that cleanup stuff. Listen, the Bible says the father cleans you up. It's called the cleansing work of the blood of Jesus Christ. All that foolishness of steps that I got to do this and I got to do that and I got to get myself ready to be presented to God. Listen, you're ready to be presented to God when you come to the cross of Jesus Christ. Because it is the work that Christ did on the cross that gets you into the presence of God. It was Jesus who said, no man comes to the Father except through me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. This kind of foolishness that somehow you've got to present yourself to God. It's, it's absolutely foolishness. If James had listened to the teachings of Jesus, he wouldn't have dropped off into that kind of foolishness. He wouldn't have dropped off into that kind of foolishness. And there's a good reason why nobody put a promise of God to that foolishness. There are the steps. It is believe in the Lord Jesus Christ that he died for your sins and buried and raised from the dead the third day. When you believe it, you're saved. I don't care what kind of condition you're in. The rest of that is just garbage. Don't you listen to, don't you listen to the world send your soul to hell when it doesn't have to be? And people on the internet, you need to get your eyes opened. This is absolute foolishness. That somehow you've got to clean yourself up. You've got to mourn and weep and, and be gloomy in order to come into the presence of God. That's not true. The blood of Jesus Christ is the only presence, the only thing that God, you can present to God that's, that God is acceptable of. All this foolishness of cleaning yourself up. It's a pig that's come out of the wall and cleaned up a little bit. It goes back to the... As soon as, he, as soon as you clean a pig up, he goes right back in Waller's. That's his home. He's not going to go to the house. People, uh, we raised pigs. We raised them one year and got rid of them. They're the nastiest critters in the whole world. People having a... I go like, are these people nuts? They got a pig as a... My grandfather wouldn't have a pig on his property after one year with him. No, I like pig. I like to eat him, but I don't like to raise him. <laughs> listen, this is most, this, listen, the father said, listen to this. The father said, I had to preach just a moment. The father said, the father said, look, the father said to his slaves, to his servants, the, listen, the father says to his servants, bring quickly, Bring quickly out the best robe and put it on him. Put the ring on his hand. You know what a ring that is? That's the father's ring, man. You know whose robe that is? That's the father's robe. Put the father's robe on the son. Put the, put the father's ring on, his, on my son. Put the sandals. Ain't no more barefoot baby of mine. Put the sandals on my son's feet. You know what he called him? He called him three times as he dressed him. This is my son. This is my son. He says to the servants, this is my son. This is my son. This is my son. You know why he's saying that? For the son to understand, you're not coming back as a slave. You're coming back as a son. When you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, you become a son of God. You're not a slave to the world. You're a son of God. The world would like to keep you a slave all of your life. Send your soul to hell with the devil. Revelation, the 20th chapter. 
I love this. He <laughs> bring the best robe for my son, the best ring for my son, the best sandals for my son. Fill a fa- kill a fatted calf. Let's eat and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead, has come to life again. This son of mine that was lost has now been found. All of that is the view of God the Father and not the Son nor the servants and certainly not the world. James should have paid attention, in my opinion, he should have paid attention to that sermon that Jesus preached. It is true that God is opposed to the proud, and it is true that he gives grace to the humble, but he gives it to them on the basis of grace and not on the basis of works. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and not of yourself is a gift of God. It is a gift. It's not wages from works. It's a gift. Don't let anybody take grace away from you. It's the greatest doctrine your soul could ever believe in, the grace of God. I ran over a little bit tonight, but I had to preach a little bit. I had to preach a little bit. I had to preach a little bit. Let me pray and I'll get the Internet off. We'll have a little prayer of ourselves. Listen, those of you that have come with us tonight by the Internet, please listen to me. I don't care who's told you, you got to work your way. You got to clean yourself up. Listen, the blood of Christ cleans you up. He does a lot of things for you. But he takes you just like you are. Without one plea. My, my. He died for you and me. Come by grace through faith and not of yourself. Christ died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead. Believe that and get saved. I don't care where you are. I don't care if you're in the underground radio program. Right where you are sitting there today, you can believe that Christ did this for you to bring you in the kingdom and take you out of the pit and mire of slavery of this world and give you a life in Christ that is unbelievable, wonderful. And this life that Christ gives you will last you through time and eternity. You won't find a deal like that anywhere from the world. Life, quality of life and time and eternity, come on. And so, our Father, we lift this message to the people that have listened to us tonight. And I pray, Father, they would have the courage to submit to God, resist the devil, and believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ, and they will be in in a split second, in the twinkling of an eye, they can be saved by grace through faith and not of themselves. It is a wonderful gift. We believe that with all of our heart and we've preached it in Jesus' name. Amen.